last one. Here we go. All right, so we're up and running here. So, all right, so tonight, uh, what is it? It's the 21st of September, September 21st, 2017. That's so, awesome. you know, Steve uh, was out of, out of town, joined us last week from Alabama, is now uh, back with us, had, had posed an interesting question that a number of you guys had, had posed uh, either through text message or through the internet regarding what my thoughts were relating to the end times and all of the crazy weather stuff that's been going on. You know, we just you know, came back after uh, a disastrous Hurricane Irma here in Miami, Miami Beach, and then prior to that, in Bernadine, we had, uh, in Houston, had what, 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 Hurricane Harvey, and today, I understand, Puerto Rico is now without power for the next six months, at least parts of it, because of Hurricane Maria, which struck, I guess, yesterday. Um, and uh, there was an earthquake uh, two days ago in Mexico, and uh, a couple hundred people were killed. And it's my understanding that during Hurricane Irma, there was another earthquake in Mexico, but I didn't know because I, I didn't have access to the television. So, uh, so yeah, I found out afterwards that that it looks like we had three hurricanes and two earthquakes, two major earthquakes, within the space of about, uh, you know, uh, ten days, two weeks. And so people have been asking me, is this a sign of the end times? And I would have to say unequivocally that the answer is yes. And uh, let me just adjust this real quick. And, you know, uh, Tonight we're supposed to be finishing up Revelation 13, uh, which relates to the Antichrist, and we've, we've done a lot of talking about the Antichrist and, and who this guy is and, and what his role would be and all of that. But um, Steve had asked me if I would take a little time and address, uh, you know, what we find in Scripture related to this concept of the end times, the last days, and specifically. Uh, the rapture, because September 23rd, for many of you guys who have been on the internet, you've seen that there have been a flood of YouTube videos and postings on different Bible prophecy sites, or, and even on general conspiracy websites. People at alternative news and conspiracy uh, websites have been posting information about the rapture that supposedly somebody figured out was going to occur on Saturday at, you know, 3 p.m. on September 23rd of uh, 2017, based upon signs of the heavens and the earth and the fact that there was a uh, uh, solar eclipse, and supposedly so many days from the solar eclipse, somebody figured out that would be the rapture. So, I thought I'd take a little time and, and do a quick segue away from that, um, and from, from our text of tonight. I sent you guys all the text message to do your homework on uh, Revelation chapter 13. But I'd like to take a second just to, to sort of look real quick um, at Matthew chapter 24 and 25 and then at verses related to the rapture because it, it, it is it's so tangential uh, that we have these signs in, in the weather and, and in the earth and, and we have you know, teaching that, that a rapture is going to occur. So Steve, open us up in prayer real quick, and then we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at that. Lord God, we thank you for a time for us to, to be able to gather tonight. Lord, it's a lot we had to go through to get here. We had to, you know, it was a little bit of, you know, a little bit of adversity to survive, Lord, that uh, allowed us all to come back here for another study. I want to pray that we um, clear away whatever it is we have going on in our day to set aside this time. Uh, for a little bit of fellowship, Lord, but also to the study of the Word, Lord, prepare for the things that you know that we are watching unfold, that you prophesied, or you know, that you've uh, sent to prophets and apostles to you know, give us warning about. Lord, I pray that uh, you put the words that uh, hurt me to say tonight, Lord, and kind of address some of these things. And uh, Lord, that we'll all be at Bereans and take a look at what the Scripture says. Uh, once we finish here tonight, Lord, and thank you again for this time to for us to to, to gather. Lord, we pray for uh, for clarity here tonight and just understanding. In Jesus' name, I pray. All right. So the the reason why I think it's important to, to kind of segue away and and do a, a quick touch up on the rapture, which we looked at 
uh, back in, I think it was uh, July, I think we looked at the end of July maybe it was, uh, maybe early August, but the rapture is an imminent event that it certainly presaged or uh, harbinged, if you will, by signs in the heavens and the earth. And earthquakes and famines and war and all these things we find that Jesus laid out for us in Matthew 24. And they are supposed to be warning signs like the bridge is out ahead, you know, the bridge is out, you know, very closely ahead, the bridge is out right around the corner, and these are the signs. Now it doesn't say the bridge is out 1,356 feet from here, but basically these signs that we're seeing, and I think that there's no question that the signs, Hurricane Maria, uh, preceded by Hurricane Irma, preceded by Hurricane Harvey, Harvey and with, with a couple of major earthquakes in Mexico uh, interspersed in uh, there, are, are all indicators. Because, you know, I know Ben earlier was saying, you know, September is hurricane season, certainly down in, in South Florida it is, and, you know, uh, for this part of the geographical region, certainly September is, is, is hurricane season. But it is an earthquake season. So and we have two earthquakes in an area that hasn't had an earthquake in about a century, um, is, is probably indicia of something uh, more than uh, just the normal run-of-the-mill, you know, everyday things. And since I was able to get my, uh, finally got my satellite TV working and running again last night, I was able to turn on CNN and some of the news channels, and I noticed that, uh, you know, President Trump was in uh, South Korea, I guess it was, uh, or, and had a meeting with, uh, with the South Korean president to discuss the North Korean president, you know, Kim Jong-un, who, who successfully, by the way, was able to detonate a bomb, but not just any bomb, a atomic bomb, but not just any type of atomic bomb, but a hydrogen bomb, which is the most powerful type of atomic bomb. And it, it was, you know, a hydrogen bomb is, you know, five times, maybe 10 times, maybe even 100 times, the strength of the first atomic bomb that was dropped on uh, Hiroshima in World War II, and then it was followed up a few weeks later by a hydrogen bomb that was dropped on, I think it was Nagasaki, that was multiple, exponentially more powerful. And so Kim Jong-un has, you know, under the radar, slipped in, built himself one, and we, we, we you know, it's almost like a bait swift, the shell game. We, we, we've been watching, uh, you know, Iran for all these years and trying to make sure that they can't get one, and, you know, right under our noses, North Korea got one, built one, and detonated. So you see these things, and so now, you know, President Trump has to, you know, get together with the South Korean president and try to, you know, form some type of an alliance. And at the same time, it was either the Secretary of Defense, possibly, I think it was, that said earlier this week that um, one of the, uh, the news shows that, you know, the United States has options. We, we're the most powerful military on the face of the earth. You can believe that we have options. And President Trump followed up, up by saying that anyone who thinks that we don't have uh, options other than simply, you know, negotiation or sanctions is, is a fool. And so clearly what they're saying is that we will bomb you into the Stone Ages if you keep, you know, playing games. And so, so we have uh, tension between ourselves, the United States of America, and North Korea that we haven't ever had before. Uh, at that magnitude, you know, during the Korean War, there was, a, you know, a united Korea, and then it, you know, divided out into you know, the South and the North, and so we have, have had some, some tensions, but nothing to this extent. So you've got the confluence of all of these events which gives us, like I said, within a matter of a few days, you know, 10 days to two weeks, you know, three major monster hurricanes, not small hurricanes. I remember back in 2004, we had, we had several yeah. hurricanes that, that, that summer and fall, but uh, none of them were, were Cat 5s, and all of these are Cat 5s. And as I said, I believe Puerto Rico is now going to be without power, they're completely without power today, and parts of Puerto Rico will be without power until you know, for, for the next six months, which would put us, you know, like to Valentine's Day, yeah. you know, so, of 2018, which is crazy. Yeah. That combined with a hydrogen bomb being detonated, 
and uh, you know, a couple of major earthquakes. Goodness, we did that sad. I saw, I saw the footage of it. You know, once my, uh, you know, satellite was, was back up and running, and I saw like an entire building collapsed. And I understand that they had, they brought out the dogs. That, you know, you have like the bomb sniffing dogs during this, you know, you know, drug uh, investigations, and then in disasters you have. Uh, the other sniffing dogs, which are, you know, body sniffing dogs, dogs that go through the wreckage of a disaster, whether it be a bombing or an earthquake or, you know, a mining disaster or something, so that they can sniff out the remains of human beings. And I noticed that they have the dogs already going through several of the buildings that had collapsed or partially collapsed in Mexico. And so, you know, the death toll is probably at, you know, over 200 now. And so they've got, they, I saw them trying to extract somebody today, and the one, uh, uh, you know, body that they were able to extract was someone who was deceased, and they had said that they believed that there was a girl in, under the rubble, and she was still alive, and all that. So I say all that to say that we are certainly entering into a phase of our existence as a planet that seems to be unprecedented for the confluence and the closeness of uh, these disasters and saber rattling, the idea of a nuclear war, you know, and all of those things taken together are part and parcel of what Jesus had warned about in Matthew chapter 24. So, like I said, I was going to take a little time tonight to, to sort of segue into that, and we, we have so much meat on the bone yet for uh, Revelation chapter 13 and the Antichrist. And, and we certainly we don't want to rush through any of that. So we're going to look real quick at, at, at Matthew 24 and what Jesus uh, warned about in his Olivet Discourse. And also a moment, a word about, about the rapture. Uh, back in 2011, uh, Harold Camping, who was a sort of well-known uh, Bible prophecy scholar, though he wasn't a, a standard, you know, evangelical, born-again Christian like you and I were. I, I never considered him a real Christian, but the problem is the media promotes <clears throat> people like Harold Camping, who said he predicted to the day, he, he in fact, in 2011, he had narrowed it down to the hour. He told us, this is going to be based upon, you know, the time when it strikes noon in Jerusalem, it'll be uh, X time on the East Coast, so Eastern Standard Time, the rapture will happen on you know, uh, Saturday, blah, 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 in September. And when it didn't happen on uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is what he had predicted, um, he said that he had missed the variable in his algebraic equation because he should have, you, you know, multiplied the divisor by the sum of the two parts as opposed to, you know, the, you know, the exponent or something like that. And he came up with a new date, which was in October, which was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So he was like, no, no, it's definitely going to happen. And so he had CBS, he had uh, 60 Minutes, CNN, and all of the major news organs were interviewing him and whatever. And then when it didn't happen, not once but twice, you know, it cast dispersion on all biblical Christians who believe in the concept of the rapture. The rapture, the Bible says, is our blessed hope. It's the most important thing in our faith after we become born again. We look forward to being reunited with Jesus and, uh, you know, to, to have somebody be able to assault that concept from within. I think it's a Luciferian, meaning a satanically devised plot that is hidden in subterfuge. And what I mean by that is that I suspect that what, what has happened is, as John Todd had warned about back when he became a born-again Christian, gave those that you know, those important warnings back in 1978 in the churches he spoke at before he was, uh, you know, possibly killed by the powers that be. He said that there were Satanists who disguised themselves within the body of the church and will come out as ministers and teachers and pastors. And certainly we see people promoting on YouTube any number of individuals who just like when we had the uh, 2012 craze on December 21st, 2012, the world was going to come to an end. You had people who called themselves uh, born again Christians who were selling books and uh, videotapes and doing all these different things that generated income for them. And then when you know December 21st came and went, and uh, we we got into this in January of 2013, 
these guys kind of disappeared off the map for about six months, and then they popped back up a year later, selling more books, explaining why, no, we weren't wrong, we weren't, and, and the same thing is happening. If you, if you go on YouTube and you look at, uh, you know, many of those uh, different sites, like I said, th there's any number of individuals who are teaching the concept of the rapture happening this coming Saturday. And so this coming Saturday, I would say it is almost certain that the rapture will not happen this coming Saturday because you've got so many fake Christians out there on the internet telling everybody that this coming Saturday is when the rapture is going to happen. And we find out from Jesus that kind of when you're not expecting it, that's when I'm coming. And so he might come tomorrow and he may come Sunday. But of those three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Saturday is the least likely day because you got so many people out there on YouTube making money, selling books, you know, figuring out the solar eclipse and all these crazy things that have pinpointed down to the very hour when Jesus was going to come back at the rapture. And clearly, Jesus is saying in Matthew 24, you can know the time of the season, but you can't know the exact day or hour. And so, why don't we go ahead and do this? Uh, let's just take a look real quick. Um, what have you, you oh, start us off, Steve, by just one, give us a, a rundown from Matthew 24. Right through 14, 1 through 14, and then Ben, you're going you're gonna to run down from uh, 15 through, uh, through 35. So you got, you got a big chunk of, chunk of territory for us to cover. Um, just because I want you guys to get a sense of, of what this Olivet Discourse is. Now Olivet Discourse is uh, a gathering. Jesus had given uh, a sermon in one of his favorite spots, the... Mount of Olives, which is right across from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and afterwards, you know, he, he had talked about end times and the coming of in coming of the end of the world and all of that. And afterwards, his his inner circle of, of disciples, John, uh, Peter, uh, Andrew, and I think James, came to him and asked him privately, "Hey, Master, when will these things occur? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world?" And Jesus gave him a, a special Bible prophecy press briefing that is instructive for us. And, you know, it's, it's probably the most famous and most instructive of all of the uh, Bible prophecy uh, deliveries or dialogue that Jesus addressed because it gives us such specificity and detail. So go ahead, if you would, uh, Matthew chapter 24 verses 1 through 14. It's called the Olivet Discourse because it was on the Mount of Olives that he's discussing these things with the people and then he gives a breakdown to his, his inner circle. So go ahead and start us out there, Steve. Okay. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And let me stop right there. Remember again, we, we talked the last time we talked about this, that that phrase in the King James, nation shall rise against nation, actually is the Greek word ethnos. So that word is better translated, ethnic group shall rise against ethnic group. And then in the next clause, kingdom against kingdom, that's, that's the nation of the United States of America versus the nation of... North Korea. Kingdom is kingdom means a uh, geopolitical entity, but the term nation isn't speaking of Canada versus the United States. It's speaking black versus white, Indians versus the Cowboys, uh, the Sudanese against Afghanis. Ethnic groups within the human race are going to be at loggerheads with one another. And do we see that today? We absolutely do. We absolutely see ethnic unrest at an all-time high, and that's one of the signs, and that's so critical, that Jesus was able to see through into the future and say, man, there's going to be ethnic unrest 
amongst the people in a time where he was he's speaking to a, an all Jewish audience at this point in time. Everybody was Jewish, so there weren't any other ethnic groups to even really uh, be part of the address that he gave. But he was seeing into the future because he was God in the flesh. So pick it up from there, Steve. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they, shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false, false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, so if you look back, you know, Steve was able to point out in verse 7, it says, uh, you know, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be what? Famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. And so when you have a couple of earthquakes in Mexico, which hasn't had one in over a century, that's, you know, different than where you normally... You know, the New Madre fault line, or maybe uh, the San Andreas fault in California, or some places in, in Asia that, that are typical for earthquake and tectonic uh, sort of activity. You know, that's, you know, you see this, usually you would see the same earthquakes in the same general geographic areas over and over and over again. But when you start seeing the different places, the term diverse comes to mind. It means like places where you don't normally see them, you're seeing them. And so we have ethnic unrest, we have the threat of international geopolitical war, and earthquakes as signs that, what? That Jesus is coming back. And so we have that right now. We have that within the last few days. And we've had it at an unprecedented level. So, long short of it is, what Jesus is saying here is that when you see the stuff that's been happening here, in South Florida, United States of America, and the planet Earth over the course of the last couple of weeks, you should be now alerted that, uh-oh, this is the, the roadmap that was laid out, the confluence, uh, the aggregation of various signs coming together to show that the Messiah is going to be coming back, coming back first for his church in an event called the Rapture, which we will look at in a second, and then coming back seven years after that to bring judgment upon the earth and put to end the kingdom of the Antichrist, which we've been in the process of studying for the last four weeks. So, uh, Steve, where did you, uh, did you, you got through to which first? I went to 14. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so, so you see that, and, and so what Ben is about to, to tell us is, uh, you know, what he's gonna lay out next is, Jesus is now fast forwarding through the period of time which leads up to the rapture, because there's two comings we're going to be looking at. The first coming is for the church in the air to take the church home to the Father's house, be married to him. And then, seven years later, he comes back with the church to establish the millennial reign of Christ, the, the kingdom of God on earth. And during that seven year sort of uh, period of time, a new ruler will take over the Antichrist, the person we've been studying for the last four weeks will reign on the planet Earth, unite the planet Earth together, and reign for a series of period of time during this seven year period of time. The last three and a half years of which, there will be bloodshed, destruction, and death on an unprecedented scale, of which time Ben is about to talk to us about. So what Ben is about to tell us about is that period of time during the seven year sort of interregnum period after the church has been removed from the planet Earth in the event called the rapture and prior to Jesus coming back from the Father's house with his now married to bride, the church. The church has now become the bride of Christ and we come back together to establish the kingdom of God on earth in what's been commonly referred to as the millennial reign of Christ on earth. So, Ben, start us out if you would, uh, verse 15 and run on now all the way through to verse 35. When ye, shall, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Let me stop it right there. Okay, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the, the prophet Daniel. Daniel gave us a series of prophecies, one of which 
is the metallic man dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which had four major kingdoms of the world, the head of gold, Babylon, chest of silver, media Persia, hips of brass, Greco, uh, the Greek Roman, Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, and then the lakes of iron, which is the Roman Empire that sort of uh, segued into the Roman Catholic Church system and eventually uh, sort of phased out of existence but was never destroyed. And then you have a revival of that Roman Empire in the form of the feet of the statue that has earthy clay mixed with uh, uh, miry clay and, and earthy clay mixed together with, with iron. And the two don't cling to one another. And we've talked in times past about how that may be an indication that individuals that are not human but hybrids are now interspersing themselves in the human race through uh, genetic engineering or through sexual intercourse to create a hybrid race of people that are interacting with the sons of Adam. And that there's going to be tension between these two groups. And that's what all of these science fiction shows that we've seen, whether it be Jessica Alba and Dark Angel and back in you know, 1999 or 2000 through 2002, you know, promoting the idea that the transgenic you know, humans are part human and part enhanced and discrimination against them is sort of like discrimination against gay people. And then you have the sort of X-Men series of movies that are adaptations of the Marvel comic series where you have exactly the same paradigm. People who have genetic enhancements are being discriminated because the regular people won't accept them into society and you're sort of being conditioned by superhero movies and the action movies on television like Jessica Alba and Dark Angel or whatever, what have you, um, uh, I, to accept the idea or the concept of enhanced humans as being the ideal. And if you have a problem with that, you're the one that's the bigot, you know, uh, trying to keep people in the closet, whatever, heroes. It was a series, television series in 2006 that ran for like four years. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that. Where there was one who was a cheerleader, she had these super enhanced powers, she could like monkey flame, and then it turned out everybody in the show had some kind of superpower. And I was looking at it the other day because I couldn't get the television, but I, I got my internet and I was able to watch some, some stuff on the internet. Uh, and I, I was just sort of re watching, and I was like, man, back in 2006 when this aired, I didn't really, I wasn't as plugged in exactly. into the, the, the genetic enhancement propaganda as I am now. And I was like, man, this is so obviously clear that uh, Tim Kring, who was the director-producer uh, of the series at the time, is basically following the very same meme or uh, marching orders that uh, James Cameron, who was the director of the Titanic, was following when he introduced his television series, Dark Angel, starring and introducing to the world Jessica Alba as this super-enhanced supergirl. And during season one, it was interesting because she was the beautiful, stunningly, incredibly beautiful girl that she is today, but she had super enhanced powers. And everybody else in season one that had these, uh, they were the transgenics, the X-series transgenic. They were all stunningly beautiful people. They are all like Abercrombie and Fitch models. And it, it was season one that was sort of to get us to find them appealing and attractive. And there are heroes and our friends. And then in season two, Cameron turned the corner and introduced us to the other transgenics, the half dog, half man, the half, you know, lizard, half man, these hideous monstrosities, but we'd already been conditioned in season one to accept all of them as our friends and heroes and, uh, you know, to look at them as the saviors of the human race so that even when the hideous monstrosities like the half lizard, half man, or the half goat, half man, you know, came on the screen, you were supposed to, like, feel the same sort of, and it was seductive in the way they did it. They, they had the beautiful Jessica Alba co-starring with Jensen Ackles, who was a very handsome guy who now plays on the TV series Supernatural, which is, promotes and, and glorifies the occult. And so you sort of see in the Hollywood entertainment industry how this paradigm of genetic engineering is being promoted. And so to get back to what Ben just read, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Dan, uh, Daniel is, I think, none other than the Antichrist going into the temple of God that's rebuilt during this time after the rapture. The 70th week of Daniel takes place. Halfway through, the Antichrist goes into the temple of God, sits on the mercy seat, 
and declares himself to be God. And what we were going to be looking at uh, later on tonight is uh, a portion of scripture that would suggest that the Antichrist isn't just a bad guy. The Antichrist is almost certainly a genetic hybrid, a Nephilim, a part human who is also part fallen angel or demonic. Now, whether or not he obtains that enhancement because he's some kind of a bloodline satanic prodigy that throughout the years when the Nephilim impregnated humans and created a race of beings called the Nephilim, which Jesus in, in Matthew 24 said will be on the earth at, at the days of Noah and also after that, whether or not the Antichrist was born that way or like Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10, so those of you that are doing your homework, go back and take a look at Genesis chapter 10 when we get finished here tonight, and take a look and see what the Bible says about Nimrod and how he began to become a mighty one in the earth. And the term mighty one in the original Hebrew is Gibberim, which is the same word that's used to refer to the hybrid race of individuals that the Bible in Genesis chapter 6 calls the Nephilim. The mighty ones, the Gibberim and the Nephilim, are one and the same, synonymous terms. Nimrod was able to turn himself through, the Bible says, genetic, sexual, or ritual defilement of himself. And it, it's interesting when you sit down and look at, uh, you know, uh, First and Second Chronicles that, you know, make reference to Nimrod changing himself through a defilement ritual that was of a sexual nature. That sexual doesn't necessarily mean he was having a... Uh, you know, uh, some type of inappropriate uh, intercourse with the temple prostitute, it could also mean that he was able to tamper with his gene line cells, meaning his sexual reproductive cells, uh, and that he was able to change that from within through some type of ritualistic defilement of his uh, sex cells and able to make himself into a overman or more than just a mere human. He changed himself from an Adamic man into a Gibberim, a superman, an overman, and it was considered desirable. So we see that it's already been accomplished, you know, millennia ago by Nimrod through occultic practices that probably had some sounding or basis in what we would call today uh, genetic engineering. Human genetic engineering is is, is largely, has largely been outlawed as being immoral or whatever, but now the justification is that, hey, if we can, you know, splice out certain genes or groupings of human DNA that code together for a certain function, we can cut out bad genes and replace them with good genes and get rid of uh, diseases like cancer or Tay-Sachs disease or multiple dystrophy or muscular sclerosis, uh, uh, muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis. And so there's always a justification for you know, you know tampering with the original image of God in human form, which was man. The yeah, Adam was created in the image of God, and so you know man, the original man Adam, was sort of the body and flesh manifestation of what God is in a physical body until sin contaminated and corrupted that image, and then Jesus came back and refixed it. So Satan has attempted to do that throughout the years. And so what Ben just read was the abomination of desolation. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation, so now he's talking about a period of time after the church age is over. The church age ends with the rapture of the church into heaven. So now Jesus is saying, after the rapture and during the 70th week of Daniel, you're going to see the abomination of desolations spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So like, what is he talking about? He's talking about Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel points out in Daniel chapter 9 that, you know, uh, the people, the prince that shall come will destroy the temple and do various things. And in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, and in Daniel chapter 2, there is a discussion of the Antichrist going into the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Paul writes about the very same uh, passage several years after Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he makes reference back to the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. And the way Paul characterizes it is that so that this individual, the Antichrist, he, as God, enters into the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination of desolation that Ben just made reference to. So, uh, from there, Ben, pick up.
Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Stop right there. And so that's where we get the phrase, the great tribulation. The first part of the tribulation period is tribulation. You know, it's a bad time on the earth, even though there's a false sense of peace. But the second half of the tribulation period, the second 1260 days, or the second 42 month period of time, when the week, the prophetic 70th week of Daniel is divided in two, the first half of the week, you got relatively good time for the Antichrist and the false prophet through miracle signs and wonders are uniting the world together into this false form of uh, Christianity which will unite all the world together and all the different faith groups together. And finally, once he's consolidated as nefarious rule, after surviving an assassination attempt or being resurrected after an assassination attempt, the Antichrist himself will be indwelt by Satan. And at that point, he no longer needs the false Christian system or the false church system to unite the, the world together. He's now gotten the world united together and he's presented to them this mark of the beast, which next week, I, we probably won't get till to next week, you'll find that my supposition is that this mark of the beast is none other than some type of biogenetic chip that's in place under the skin of the hand or in the forehead that can rewrite the DNA, much in the same way that, that Nimrod was able to do in, in his sexual defilement rituals back you know, 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus. Um, but that will be made available to the masses and it will recode or rewrite the nucleotidal base pair so that the alphabet spell out different words than Adamic, natural born human beings have in their DNA. DNA is just a series of, really a, a series of nucleotidal acids that are grouped together in, in the form of letters. And those letters, are organized together to spell out different words. And that's how we get an eyeball. That's how we get hair. That's how we get bones. That's how we get, you know, fingernails. All of those things taken together spell out what it means to be a human being. What Satan is going to be able to do through human genetic engineering, which the mark of the beast, I believe, will be the vehicle for, is to rewrite that language, that code, that's, that codes for, spells out, Adamic human created in the image of God. Now you'll have a metahuman, or a human that's above normal, a uh, uberman, as uh, Nietzsche called him, uh, created in the image, not of the God of the universe, but of the God of this world, who is none other than Satan. And so, the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, about the seed, or the genetic uh, offspring, of the serpent, who is none other than Satan himself, will literally come true. The Antichrist will be a genetic, biogenetic descendant of Satan himself. And so will everyone else who takes the mark of the beast. Because like Nimrod, who preceded us, we will be able to rewrite our Adamic DNA into a Satanic Nephilim DNA. That's why, once you take the mark of the beast, you can no longer be eligible for salvation. It's not that God is against tattoos and so he's so angry about, he is against tattoos, but he's not so angry about tattoos that if you get a tattoo, you, you're no longer qualified to go to heaven. So somebody puts the tattoo of 666 on their hand, like, oh, I don't like tattoos. It says so in Leviticus chapter 18 and 20. Therefore, you can't be saved. No, it's got to be something far more dramatic than that. God forgives murderers, rapists, you know, killers, and of, of all, every strike. But he can't forgive taking this mark, this karabma. Why? I think it's because, as I said, it's some type of subcutaneous chip that has the capability of rewriting our DNA base codes so that it no longer spells out a down human, but spells out satanic Nephilim Superman. But it's going to be desirable because it's going to get rid of male pattern balding, 
obesity, diabetes, uh, genetic diseases will all be eliminated by encoding in satanic super genes, which will make you a godlike man here on the planet Earth. But, uh, and that may explain why in, in Revelation chapter 9, people will seek death and can't find it. Satan can't be killed. You can shoot Satan with a gun, you can't kill him. Um, and so the people that take the mark of the beast will have what they've had up long last been looking for all these years. The promise of eternal life, the inability to die, but they will have an eternal life separated from God, which will be uh, eternal damnation. And everybody that, that inherits that type of eternal life goes into the lake of fire forever. So, Again, um, I segued a little bit there, but that was instructive. So Ben, pick us up where you, where you left off and run us down all the way through to verse 35. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, so the, the great tribulation period, the second half of the 70th week of damage would be so bad that if it hadn't been limited to the 1260 days, then nobody on earth would have survived. Nobody on earth would live because all human life would cease to exist because the conditions are so bad at this point in time. But what, what Ben just pointed out is for the elect's sake, those days would be short to 1260 days. Who's the elect? The church? No, the church has already gone home to be with the, the groomsmen at the rapture. The elect are those remnant of the nation Israel that call upon Jesus as Messiah and now acknowledge him as, as the Messiah. And, um, and for the tribulation saints who come to know Jesus after the rapture has occurred, those days, and especially for, for remnant Israel, because if Satan can kill off all the Jews like he tried to do during the Holocaust, uh, during World War II, then when Jesus comes back at the end of the 70th week, the prophecies will have been frustrated and God will have been proven a liar, so he'd be a sinner just like Satan for making a mistake and falling short of the mark, just like Satan, and he couldn't throw Satan into the lake of fire. So, all Satan has to do is kill off all the Jews before the end of the 70th week of Daniel, and Jesus won't have any Jews to come back to save. And so all Israel will not be saved, as it says in Scripture, because there won't be anybody left. So if he can kill off all the Jews during the 70th week of Daniel, particularly during the second half, the Great Tribulation period, he can default God into a position of de facto sin. Because God made a promise that he knew all things, he knew the future, whatever, and he messed up. Now he didn't mean to, but you know, Satan beat him to the punch and killed off all his descendants, you know, all his chosen people, the seed of Abraham, the Jewish people. And so God fell short of the mark of perfection, which is what sin is. And so he can say, yeah, you didn't go to a strip club, you didn't rape a little girl or anything like that, but you fell short of the mark of perfection because you made a promise that you could not keep. And you claimed that you were God and that every promise that you made, you could keep. Now people know that you're no different than me. You're imperfect. You're mostly awesome, but so am I. Um, so why should I spend eternity in the lake of fire? Because I fell a little bit short by doing a couple of things that you told me not to do. You're in the same position. So he can default God into the very same position that he would be in if he can only kill off the Jews. The most simple task in the world is just to eradicate the rest of Jewish life from the earth. And he has, you know, through a legal technicality, you know, bought his way out of uh, eternity in the lake of fire. So the Bible says that God, for the elect's sake, for the nation Israel's sake, limits that period of great tribulation to 1,260 days. Because if it had gone any longer, Satan would have been able to kill off all the Jews. But he won't be able to because God will uh, limit those days. And at the end of that 1260th day, after the abomination of desolation, when Antichrist goes into the temple and declares to the world, I'm the Messiah. I'm the guy you've been waiting for all these years. Yeah, it's me. It wasn't Jesus. It was me. Here I am. I just came back from the dead. Haven't I proven myself to you? And once he's able to do that, and the whole world goes wandering after the beast, God's going to give him 1260 days after that, and then Jesus will come back to end his reign. So, that's why the days are cut short, but I digress. Ben, pick us up from there. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, and there believe it not, or there believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, 
They shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth. Let me stop right there. So, okay, so we've been saying verses 24 through 26. There's going to be false Christ, and there's going to be false preachers saying, Oh, Jesus is showing up at the church out in the row, and he's the Christ. You know, Waco, Texas, you know, uh, David Koresh claimed to be Christ in a warehouse in Waco, Texas. And people that went there to meet with the Lord met with death and destruction because. They were warned in advance, don't go anywhere on earth where they claim I am, because that's not me. Where I'm going to meet with my followers will be in the clouds above the earth. And so, uh, now Jesus is describing, uh, you know, the, the second, you know, coming. And uh, Ben's going to give us a description of that. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And again, I, I, I've said to you guys before that, that that sort of transitional phrase here says the stars will fall from heaven. He's not talking about, you know, Alpha Centauri. Uh, you know, five light years from the planet Earth is going to somehow fly through space and land in the Atlantic Ocean. But the term stars, we found out, is oft times in Scripture making reference to what? Do you know the different? No, the fallen, not angels? the fallen angels, right? The fallen angels who impregnated women and created a hybrid race of part humans called the Nephilim. But the stars commonly make reference to angels. And in this case, it says that there are certain angels that will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, Ben? Uh, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he, sh he shall send his angels with a great shout of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of he heaven to the other. Okay, so when we when we see that passage, a lot of people misapprehend that and say, well, see, that proves that, you know, that's making reference to a partial rapture or a rapture at the end of the tribulation period. Well, no, the rapture of the church occurs seven years before that. What this is saying is that when this great trumpet sounds, there's going to be a sign in the heavens, and then everybody on earth is going to see the second coming of Jesus. The rapture is an event that you don't see. And everybody's going to see the second coming of Jesus, and they're going to mourn, and Satan's going to go out to Armageddon with his armies to meet Jesus, and they're going to get engaged in a big, huge battle called the Battle of Armageddon, which Jesus is going to win. And then after that, the elect, the people that are actually saved, who are hiding in Petra or hiding in the caves of the earth, who have absented themselves from Jerusalem to keep themselves away from the Antichrist, they will all be gathered supernaturally by Jesus from wherever they are on the planet Earth, still alive, are hiding out, and they will be called back to the city of Jerusalem. And that's what this is making reference to, the, the uh, gathering his elect from the four winds as he's about to start his millennial reign administration. So, uh, let's go ahead and have uh, Genevieve read 32 to 35 for us. Yes, sir. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when its branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is, is nigh. So likewise, ye, when he, ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. Okay, so what Genevieve has laid out for us is very important. This, this parable of the fig tree, sort of, uh, you know, um, it's basically saying, some people think that the parable of the fig tree makes reference to the nation of Israel. When you see the nation of Israel return to the land after 2,000 years, which occurred in 1948, now you know that, you know, the, the second coming is near. 
But even if that's not the case, when a fig tree uh, branch becomes tender and puts forth leaves, what do you know? You know summer is near. So in other words, Jesus is saying when you see certain visual signs, then you know that what? Summer is near. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, metaphor that was used by uh, C.S. Lewis in, in the Tales of Narnia was, you know, the, the ice queen ruled in the time of winter. Narnia had been plunged into decades-long winter. And I see that same theme being promoted in Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. It will be a long winter, you know. And so when the Messiah, which was in, in C.S. Lewis's allegory, uh, Aslan the Lion, which is an, uh, sort of an allegory of the Lion of Judah that's referenced in uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. When he approaches, winter begins to end. Snow's beginning to melt, and by seeing, oh, the polar ice cap is melting, oh my gosh, you know, the trees are starting to bloom. Oh, you know, summer is coming. And the summer is making reference to what? The warmth and the, 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 the recreation or the renewal of life on earth that we get in the spring and summertime. And so what, what, what Jesus is saying here is that when you see the fig tree put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now that's, that's you know, a horticultural reality. When, when it starts to bloom, you know that the summer is coming. Same thing in the Midwest when you saw, you know, the cherry trees in the, in, in the back blooming and the roses blooming. Oh man, springtime. Summer must be getting near. And that means winter is over. And so what we see here is that Jesus is saying, so when you see all these things, what things? The signs we just talked about. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes, um, all of these things, you should know that what? The coming of Jesus, one, for the church at the rapture is very near, and then seven years after that, um, you know, uh, we find out that he'll come back permanently. But in verse 34 it says, uh, Verily I say to you, this generation will by no, by no means pass away until all these things are fulfilled. I think that that, the interpretation for that is that the generation that witnesses all of these signs will witness the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of the millennial reign. So if the signs that he's talking about and the confluence and the frequency and the rapidity of them, uh, Kim Jong-un de detonating the hydrogen bomb, uh, there being you know, uh, three major monster hurricanes within a few uh, days uh, of each other, with two earthquakes, if that is part of the Matthew chapter 24 out of the discourse signs, what does that mean? That means that that's the same thing as seeing an olive or a fig tree, a fig tree blooming. What do you know now? Well, that's a visual sign that tells me, wait, oh, summer's coming. Oh, Jesus is coming for the church and then coming to establish his millennial reign. So if we look at the visual signs, earthquakes, hurricanes, wars and rumors of wars. I'm hearing that North Korea is going to detonate a bomb or I hear North Korea is going to shoot a missile into South Korea and that's going to force the United States to have. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, that's the same thing as seeing the fig tree starting to bloom. You don't know what day that the first rose bud is going to appear in the garden, but you know it's going to be soon. Why? Because summer's coming. Winter is over. And that's what this series of signs and the parable was given to Jesus, given by Jesus to the disciples. Why? So that the disciples could know. So that people who would read the writings of the disciples would know. So that people could draw encouragement from the bad stuff that we see happening now. Gosh, it was terrible going through Hurricane Irma. It sucked. It destroyed <laughs> my satellite dish. It put my car in the shop for two weeks. And, you know, it just... It just, it, it, it completely turned my law practice upside down, shut the courthouses down for, for, you know, over a week. It was a disaster. And then Maria comes by and does even worse in Puerto Rico. And before that, Harvey did my friend Bernadine in, in, in Houston and turned Houston into, you know, a wading pool. And uh, so we see these signs are terrible, but at the same time, it's encouraging. Why? Because it's the same thing as seeing the blooms on the fig tree. It means that winter is almost over and that summer is coming. You know, as opposed to the tagline in Game of Thrones, winter is coming. No, summer is coming. 
my friend. And with that summer will be the return of Jesus Christ to the earth, preceded by seven years by the snatching of Jesus Christ of his bride from the earth to take her back to the Father's house in heaven to marry her. So we see that the, the generation that sees these things begin to occur, that generation won't pass away. You know, in the Bible, generations is either 40 years or 70 years, generally speaking. The people that see these signs begin to occur, the entire generation isn't going to die out before the Lord returns. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, does it mean that the Lord is going to be coming within our lifetimes? It probably does. It probably does. So, um, but but again, now Ben's going to, you know, well, Steve, we're going to get you back, back in action. Steve's going to read for us verses 36 and 44. Now, I just told you that start looking for the signs because like the fig tree, when you see the signs of current earthquakes, famines, pestilence, rumors of war, that means Jesus is about to come back. And now you can know, oh, Jesus is coming, Steve. Just hang on for a little while longer. You're tired? I'm tired. Steve drove all the way back from Alabama today so he could be here for the Bible study tonight and kind of went straight, you know, from Alabama to, to come see me. And he's here tonight. And, you know, uh, after a how many hour drive was that? Eight and a half hour drive, man. He's barely keeping his eyes on it, but he's so excited to be here. You know, you know that sacrifice, man. But what Steve's about to read to us is how we can know that the YouTube prophets who are claiming that at 3 p.m. on Saturday the rapture will occur, those guys are false prophets. Notice how I'm telling you Jesus is coming any moment now because of all the signs of me. But I plan to be out. You know, preaching the gospel and passing on track Saturday morning in South Beach, like Steve and I do every week. Why? Because almost certainly the rapture isn't going to happen on Saturday. Why? Because that's when all the YouTube prophets say it's going to happen. So if it's a specific day and hour that you've been able to predict based upon a solar eclipse, then that means the Bible would be wrong if it actually happened at 3 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, Genevieve? Yeah, um, is this in conjunction with this planet X that they are? Um, given like such a big boost about, you know? Well, certainly N N Nabooru, which is also referred to as Planet X, is part and parcel of this whole false paradigm of signs in the heavens. Oh, there was a solar eclipse. Um, that means that Planet Nabooru is going to pop up in the sky within the next few days. So, yeah, you, when you see guys predicting the day and the hour of the rapture, you usually will hear something about a Planet X which is also in, in the conspiracy circles and occult circles, referred to as Nibiru and all that. So the details don't really matter. The reality, though, is that the, the individuals claiming to be Christians who may or may not make reference to any Planet X, the conspiracy theory as well, but the, the, the so-called Christians who say they know the hour of the rapture and have narrowed it down to 3 p.m. on Saturday, uh, September 23rd of this year, because the lunar eclipse occurred in what well, August, I guess it was, and they counted the days from the, the solar eclipse uh, until the, the 23rd and did some kind of uh, computations based on stuff found in the Bible and in the Apocrypha and in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the, the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead type stuff. They're, they're, they're mixing and matching and grabbing from all different types of occultic books and com coming together to predict the very day. Those guys, the, the YouTube prophets that are talking about the rapture, if you Google rapture, you almost certainly are going to find a hundred pages of stuff, 99% of which will be nonsense. It's very hard to find legitimate, solid, biblical teaching on the rapture, stuff that was done by Dave Hunt when he was still alive, and J. Vernon McGee when he was, you know, doing through the Bible radio broadcast. Those guys have moved on and they've been replaced by what I believe are Luciferian agents in disguise pretending to be believers and followers of the Lord, but who are, in fact, uh, deceptive individuals or promoting a false gospel and tying with that false gospel the idea that, hey, buy my book and I'll explain to you why the rapture is going to happen on September 23rd. Well, on Sunday, September 24th, go on Amazon because those books are going to be slashed 95%. You'll be able to get them for a dime. You know, uh, because they are promoting an idea that some man can sit down and figure out the mind of God by using a calculator. And we, we're going to find out now, because Steve's going to tell us why that isn't possible. So, give us verses 36 to 44 there, Steve. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, 
No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Okay, stop right there. Okay, so we've just been given the parable of the fig tree by Genevieve telling us, look at the signs, and when you see the signs, get happy because you know summer is coming. The Son of God is returning to the earth. You'll be able to guess and figure out when the time of the rapture which will be then followed seven years later by the second coming and the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth by looking at the signs. Now you can know the season. But what you cannot know is the day and the hour. You can't know that it's September 23rd, 2017 at 3 p.m. because Steve just told us that Jesus said you can. So anybody on YouTube is telling you the specific day and hour, September 23rd, 3 p.m., 2017. He's wrong because Jesus says nobody is smart enough to figure out the exact day or hour, because nobody knows it except God the Father, not even the Son. And so, all those YouTube prophets, I think are satanic counterfeits, who are out there promoting themselves and getting promoted on regular secular media sites to discredit the church. So that when I stand up and talk to you about the rapture and say, hey, be encouraged. Kim Jong-un may have the hydrogen bomb, and yeah, we've got these earthquake, earthquakes and hurricanes happening at breakneck pace, that just means Jesus is about to come. Then 99 out of 100 people walking down the street or going on the mall or down South Beach or wherever it is I'm doing street evangelism, they can say, ah, I've heard that crap before. Harold Camping said the same thing in 2011. How do you know? You, you can't predict the days and whatever. And that's exactly right. But I'm not predicting the day and the hour. I can't tell you it's going to be Saturday. I can tell you it's probably not going to be Saturday at 3 p.m. because that's the day all the YouTube problems are saying that it's going to occur. So that's the day. Unless you, God's using, you know, reverse psychology and saying, ah, since you know that the Bible says the day that you think I'm coming, I'm not coming, then <laughs> since if you're a real biblical Christian, you would think the Saturday isn't it? Maybe he'll do it just to trick the people that whatever. So it'll be a surprise either way. But regardless of whether it's Friday, Saturday, or Sunday that he comes in the rapture or shortly thereafter, the fact of the matter is the season that he's coming is now. We are in the season of the arrival of summer because the fig tree has already began to, uh, to put forth tender leaves. The, the bloom on the flower is coming shortly thereafter. Summer is coming because the fig tree has already begun to bloom. We know that. We don't know what day it's going to be. Um, and the reason why God does that, probably so that you can't live a life of hedonism and say, oh, I'm going to go to the strip club until Saturday at uh, 2 p.m. and then I'm going to get on my knees and pray for an hour. And as Jesus is coming, you know, in the sky for the church, I'll be in my, you know, beginning my second hour of prayer on my knees and I'm going to put some ashes on my head and rent my clothes and whatever, crawl over broken glass and, and do all kinds of fun stuff. So no, he's going to catch you by surprise. But if you're a good student of the Bible and born again, you'll be able to see all the signs, wars, rumors of war, pestilences, earthquakes, all kinds of signs in heaven and earth. And, you know, the discussion, of, I looked at some of the, uh, the global satellite, you know, pictures of Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria. And astounding, man. The cyclonic eye of the storm. Some of these, 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 these uh, time-lapse photography that we get through global positioning satellites, it's amazing what you can look at. It looks like, you know, like literally like a whirlpool that you would see in, in your bathtub when you, you, you let the drain out and all those suds and bubbles start spinning around, and you can see that. And that's something you can visually see with the eyes, and you're like, never before has the storm been that big. Especially with Irma, when I looked at, you know, before the, the television went out and then when I was on the internet and they would look, I could see the hurricane cyclonic cloud pattern around the eye, which was larger than the state of Florida itself, which is why it was pointless for us when people, all my friends out of state saying, her, you know, evacuate, leave. I'm like, where am I going to go? I don't have enough gas in my car to make it to the Georgia state line. And the airlines have raised the prices of all the tickets to $5,000 for a flight out of state. And the airports are all closed now. So there's nowhere to go. And the hurricane's bigger than the whole state. So there's no, no guarantee you can go anywhere. And so when you see stuff like that, you know you're in the season of the return of love. But you can't know the day or hour because we just found out uh, from Steve that Jesus said you can. And so pick up from there, Steve. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came, 
and took them all away. So shall, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We stop right there. Now that's interesting. Now the, I think the most typical sort of biblical interpretation of that is that things will be business as usual, just like it was in the days of Noah, and people will be marrying and giving in marriage and drinking, whatever, and they won't, just like in the days of Noah, you know, people will be unsuspecting. And, you know, I think there's, there's some legitimacy uh, to that type or line of reasoning or thought, but I see it differently, and I know there's some other um, Bible prophecy scholars that see that differently as well. It says, but as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man, or so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So, my question then would be, how is the fact that people eat and drink and get married a sign of the end of the world? It doesn't make any sense. People have been getting married since Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden and were told to be fruitful and multiple. I have a bunch of kids, having kids get married and be fruitful and fill up the whole earth. So human beings have been getting married to one another since the beginning of human history, shortly after so, yeah. the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. So we've been doing this now for about 6,000 years. So, yeah. But what if this reference to the days of Noah is specifically to trigger in your mind what happened in the days of Noah that caused God to send the flood to wipe out the whole world? What was the shocking and horrifying event that was so terrible that God destroyed the whole world with a flood? And we see right here on our color timeline, it was the fallen ones. The fallen angels came down to earth, had sexual intercourse with beautiful human women, and created a whole new hybrid race of beings on the planet Earth in addition to the human race, which were Adonic, created by God in the image of God and told to take dominion over the Earth. There was the line of the Nephilim introduced by the cohorts of Satan who had fallen from their position of heaven, defected from the third heaven, defected down from the second and first heavens and took up physical occupation in bodies and were able to marry and impregnate human women. And God became so enraged by that that he locked those angels in a fiery prison in the earth called Tartarus. And we see that referred to by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And the offspring of those fallen angels who impregnated human women were, in, according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, they were mighty men, Giborim, the men of old, men of renown. People wrote legendary stories about them. Her Hercules, Thor, Zeus, ring a bell. All of Greek and Norse mythology are based in truth, based upon the super godmen that once upon a time lived on the earth and God had to wipe them out with the flood and kill everything alive, including the animals. Why? Because Satan had introduced to the human race human genetic engineering with animals and fallen angels to create chimeras meaning half human, half fallen angels, half human, half animal. And God was so outraged at this perversion or corruption of his image that he decided to destroy everything that was alive and had breath in it, except for those that took the invitation to come into the ark where God was. And uh, Noah and his uh, three sons and their wives and his wife, they were the eight people that went into the new world. And it says Noah was perfect in his generations. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. Oh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 10, is it? I guess it is. Uh, Noah's, or later in Genesis chapter 6, the tail end of Genesis chapter 6 says, Noah was a just man uh, and perfect in his generations. He was unblemished. He was tamayim. Uh, he, he wasn't contaminated, DNA speaking. You know, he hadn't interbred with fallen angels. And so, when you look at Genesis chapter 6, the flood of Noah, now when you see Jesus making reference to, uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days when the Son of Man returns to the earth. I don't think he's saying human beings are going to eat and drink and get married, and that's a sign that I'm coming, 
Because that's what people have been doing all the time. Remember, Jesus is laying out for us here um, signs. He says, no man knows the day or the hour, but he has spent all of the preceding verses in Matthew chapter 24 giving you visual signs that you can see so that you can know. So you won't be caught off guard. God doesn't want the human race to be caught off guard at a second coming. He wants them to be on guard and to be prepared. And that's why he keeps saying, watch, yeah. watch, watch, why? Because when you see certain things, those are going to be visual cues that something really, really good and bad is coming just down the road. Rise of the Antichrist, but the rapture of the church preceding him. So why would Jesus give us the sign of human beings getting married and having dinner? Human beings have That's always done that, yeah. right? They've always done that. But if what he's saying is this, when you see him artificially, like why would he bring up Noah? Like, Noah wasn't like the only period of time on earth when people got married and had dinner, right? They've been having dinner long before Noah and they had dinner long after Noah. Why would he bring up Noah as an example of human beings getting married and having dinner uh, just like, uh, like normal? It's because I think he's not talking about people getting married and having dinner. I think he's talking about a second incursion. Because in Genesis chapter 6 verse 4, it says... There were Nephilim on the earth in those days, the days of Noah and the flood. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. So, yes, you know, it says in Genesis chapter 4, 6 verse 4, the very, very key verse and series of verses in all of the Bible that talk about this incursion of fallen demonic entities into the human gene pool, it says they were on the earth in physical form in the days of Noah, before the flood. But then it adds, and most people, even pastors that teach on the topic, fail to point out that it says, and also, after that, after what? After God killed them all in the flood, they came back. The Bible is predicting in Genesis chapter 6, verses 4, it said, the return of the Nephilim. When they came back, nobody knows for sure. But what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 and 44, is that the sign that you're to look for isn't human beings getting married and having dinner. They've always done that. That's not a sign. That wouldn't alert you to anything. No, what he's saying is that the fallen ones, the Nephilim, will have returned to the earth and they'll be getting married with human women just like they did before the flood that kicked God off so badly that he imprisoned those angels in Tartarus before the time of judgment at the great white throne when they go into the lake of fire. He imprisoned them on the spot because he was so upset and killed off all of their, their offspring with the flood. But it says they, got, they came back. The return of the Nephilim was predicted to occur after the flood of Noah. And Jesus is mentioning Noah for a specific reason and that specific reason I am convinced is that the Nephilim will have returned to the earth and they will be intermarrying with us. And what we find out from Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, is that they are also entering into our governmental relations. And that this metallic man image that we've talked about, which we see made reference to in Daniel chapter 2, verses 30 through 30, 35, is that this last portion, the revived Roman Empire, the feet of the statue will be partly miry or earthy clay and Adam's made out of clay. He's a man of earth. That's why they call him Adam. Because he's sort of a ruddy red, reddish, reddish brown man. You know, made from the earth. And that's why he was called Adam or Adam. You know, because it's reddish which is the color of the clay that he was made out of. And they mingle themselves, it says in, in uh, Daniel chapter 2, Verses 40 on where it says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed or the DNA of men, but they won't cling to one another. So if you boys and girls go to Daniel chapter 2, start reading from verse 40 onward, and you're going to see of the revived Roman Empire ruled by the Antichrist, there are going to be regular Adamic human beings in that empire of the Antichrist, but also there are going to be non-humans who will be able to mingle themselves with the DNA of human beings during the kingdom of the Antichrist, during the 70th week of Daniel, just prior to Jesus coming back. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 24, 
verse 36 through 44, when he talks about, you know, in verse 38, as it was in the days of Noah before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving themselves in marriage. The they that they're talking about is the same they from Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, where it says, they shall mingle themselves with the sea of men, but they will not cling to one another. And so let's see if I can, let's just, let's just flip there real quick. And just, we can just read it real quick uh, before we move on. Because that's sort of a controversial area, and I think a lot of people have missed that, and I think that that's really what is being said. Why would Jesus out of the blue mention Noah? Like, what does Noah have to do with the second coming? He really doesn't have anything to do with it. And if you look at verse 43, And as you saw iron mixed with earthy clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed. Remember, that's, that's another word for DNA. They will mingle themselves with the DNA of men, but they will not adhere to one another. So if the they that are doing the mixing or the mingling with human DNA, they can't be human. They've got to be something other than human. So the they there, the personal pronoun, they have to be something other than the seed of men. So individuals represented by a personal pronoun, they are mingling their seed or their DNA with human beings. And that is what Daniel is tipping us off to as will be the composition of the kingdom of the Antichrist during the 70th week of Daniel. Why? Because those people took the mark of the beast and like Nimrod who preceded them, were able to rewrite their DNA from normal Adamic human uh, beings into super metahuman, you know, over men who are now God men on the earth. But they are also no longer Adamic. Jesus came to earth as the second man the last Adam to die for the sins of the original Adam and all of Adam's descendants. He didn't die on the cross for the Nephilim. He didn't die on the cross for fallen angels. There is no substitutionary blood sacrifice that's already been paid in advance to forgive or propitiate the sins of the fallen angel or the offspring of the fallen angels. Why? Because the offspring of the fallen angels, the Nephilim, are not Adamic men. Jesus became an Adamic man to pay for the sins of the original Adam and his descendants. The Nephilim aren't the descendants of Adam. The Nephilim are the descendants of Satan. Therefore, those individuals are legally disqualified from the free gift of salvation that's already been paid for in blood by Jesus. But for us, it's free of charge. The Nephilim can't qualify for that homeowner's loan because they are not in the text of individuals who qualify for that substitutionary sacrifice. Only Adamic men. That's why the taking of the mark of the beast, which we'll look at next week in detail, is in my mind and in my belief, based on all I've studied, a biogenetic chip that will rewrite your DNA. Now God can't save you, no matter how much he wants to. No matter how compassionate he is for you, if you repent and ask for forgiveness during the end of the 70th week of Daniel, it's like, but you took the mark and I told you not to. Because it says, and we're going to see that next week when we get to it, that once you take that mark of the beast, you are forever disqualified, no questions asked, from salvation. You can be forgiven for murder, genocide, rape, all kinds of evil, terrible things. But taking the mark of the beast is such an insult to God that he would say, oh, I don't like tattoos. And you got a tattoo, little, little girl. I'm not going to forgive you. You're going to hell. No. It's because that mark of the beast is something more than just a tattoo. It is a biogenetic chip. Rewriting your DNA, just like Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10, you will be able to change who you are from just being a mere mortal to becoming a God-man on the earth. But in doing so, you forfeit eternal life. And so when Satan and the other fallen angels are, you know, escorted out to the lake of fire forever, well, they'll be quarantined from the rest of God's creation. You're going to have to be quarantined there too because you will be a genetic descendant of the fallen one. And you will inherit the, the punishment of your father, who is no longer God, but Satan. And so, there you have that. So, what do we have? Uh, pick us up then, Steve. 
For as the, okay, uh, let's see. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this. Let me stop right in. I move they punt in the interpreting of this passage. Matthew 24 here is talking about the rapture as opposed to the second coming. Both the rapture and the second coming is referenced in the Olivet Discourse. But here, two men will be taken in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. It's a wonderful, perfectly clear picture of the rapture. And then Jesus adds in verse 42, what? Watch. Watch, therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is. What are you watching for? You're watching for signs of not the second coming. Right. Everybody's going to know the second coming when it's coming. Satan's going to gather his army, go out to Armageddon to meet him. You're supposed to watch for signs leading up to the rapture. Because the rapture is going to be so instantaneous, there'll be no opportunity to prepare for it in advance. So if you see the signs as you're approaching, you can't know the day or the hour, but you can know the season. Like right around this corner, man. It should be the rest stops should be coming up. They say the signs keep saying, you know, prepare, you know, prepare to stop, you know, whatever. It doesn't tell us how many feet it's gonna be away, but that rest stop is coming up because we keep seeing the signs saying rest stop, behaving on the side of the road, coming up, you know, coming up real soon, coming up real, real soon. And so the signs are a way of giving you a compassionate nudge on the shoulder. Hey, I'm about to come to the church. When I come, it's going to be so instantaneous, there won't be any chance or time for you to get prepared. You won't be able to know in advance. But get ready now, because it's just about to happen. And that's what happened with the ten virgins that we're going to look at. Five of them weren't ready when it happened, and they got left behind, even though they went to church and served on the usher board and, you know, sang in the choir. But they weren't born again, and so while they were trying to get born again and figure out how, what you have to do in addition to going to church to get saved, Jesus came for the church, the real church that's born again, and took them, and when the others figured out, oh, you got to be born again. Hey, let us in, you know, let us in. Jesus says, too late now, the door is closed, and the rapture has already occurred. So, Steve, yeah, pick us up from uh, verse uh, 43. Okay. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. That's why I say all the YouTube prophet, prophetic warriors are saying, we know he's coming at 3 p.m. on Saturday, September 17th, 23rd, 2017. You can't, because he just said yeah. that the hour that you think he's coming, that's when he's not. He says, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have once not allowed his house to be broken into. Verse 24, therefore, be ye also ready, for the Son of Man is coming in such an hour as you think he is not. When you expect him not, that's when he's coming. So, if everybody's expecting him Saturday at 3, that's when he's not coming. He's going to come Friday night at 9, catch everybody off guard. So, be, be getting ready from right now. If you're not born again, pray the sinner's prayer and ask Jesus to save you. Let's jump ahead to Matthew 25. Um, and uh, if you would have been... Uh, just read for us uh, the first uh, 13 verses there. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom, bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, 
Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So that's not as clear as the day, the uh, nose on my face, that you can't know the day or the hour. But you know you can know the season, because he keeps saying watch. If it's, if it's pointless to look at the signs, he wouldn't say watch, watch, watch for the signs, watch for the signs. Why? Because I'm not going to tell you the day or the hour. I want you to be in a constant state of readiness. And as you see the signs, I'm giving you a hint, because I want you guys to be ready. You know, I'm kind of hinting what the topics are going to be on the pop quiz next week. So study those topics. I'm not going to tell you the exact questions, sure. but I'm going to tell you the topics. Study those this week. You know, don't go out and party all week because we've got the pop quiz coming on uh, next week. <laughs> Can't tell you if it's going to be Monday or Wednesday, but I can tell you the topics, and I can tell you it'll be after Monday and before Friday. So all you got to do is be prepared for that little window of time by studying up on all your material. So what he's saying here is clear. You can't know the day of the hour. And then he tells you to watch. Why watch for something I can't see? Because even though you can't see the day and the hour, you can know the season and the time that the Son of Man is coming. Not in the second coming. Everybody on earth is going to see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens and, and mourn for it. But the rapture, which you cannot see coming, which was just described to you in the form of the ten virgins, I think five of those virgins were born-again Christians who were filled with the Holy Spirit because they were actually and truly born again. The other five were religious people who considered themselves Christians, went to church, sang in the choir, volunteered for the homeless ministry, volunteered for the usher board, uh, did all kinds of uh, works, you know, earthquake victims in Haiti, they packed up the bags and sent stuff, and, you know, they did all the wonderful things that people do to, uh, you know, to, to, to curry favor with God. And those things cannot save you. And so the five virgins that were already filled with oil, I think of the morning in Christians who were actually already saved. And then the five foolish were the ones who were not wise and said, oh man, give us some of your oil, which is in the Bible usually symbolic of what? The Holy Spirit. And so he's give us some of your oil. And they go, no, nope, you got to go out and buy because there won't be enough for all of us. When they were out buying or going out trying to figure out how to become a born-again Christian, what it means to be born again, guess what happened? The Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus came back and they were left behind. And then, once they figured out how salvation works, they came and banged on the door and said, open unto us, open unto us. And says, no, we can't let you in. You know, it's too late. Bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to what? To the wedding. Which wedding? To the wedding at the marriage feast of the Lamb, which will occur, according to Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 10, at the Father's house in heaven, when the church becomes the bride of Christ. They missed out on it, the five foolish virgins, because they were out trying to figure out how, what, what it means to really be a born-again Christian, as opposed to just being a quote-unquote Christian, end quote. And so they knocked on the door to the wedding and they couldn't come in. And the Lord had to say, man, those who were ready went in with him. The door was shut. The other virgins came also and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. So they knew his name. But he answered and said, I do not know you. And then he says, mercy to him, watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour of the man is coming, but you can know the season, guys. And that's it, you know. So I'll, uh, I'll kind of you know, wrap this up right there. Uh, I'll just I'll just read for you real quick the verses that relate to the rapture that I think are most on point and and that way you can see the the concept of the rapture is definitely laid out in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 but the most clear passages are uh, John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3 it says let not your heart be troubled Jesus is saying to his disciples at the Last Supper believe ye believe in God believe also in me in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus is saying he's going away to the Father's house to prepare a place for me, so that when the preparation for the house is done, he'll come back and get me and take me to the Father's house, where we'll be together. That's the rapture. I don't see how people can misconstrue that as going through the tribulation period and fighting against the Antichrist until he kills you. 
Uh, no. And then we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll just read verses 51 and 53 for us real quick. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Sleep in the Bible is oftentimes a euphemism as we learn with Lazarus and Jesus raising Lazarus from the bed. No, he got raised from the dead, not the bed. Sleep is a euphemism for death in the scriptures. So Paul is using Jesus' uh, euphemism that was applied to Lazarus when, oh, if he's sleeping, he'll be okay. You know? No, you know, Jesus says to, uh, who was it, uh, Thomas, he's like, Lord, well, why waste the time? He's sleeping, well, uh, you know, he might have had too much to drink. Let him sleep it off. Like, no, no, you know, uh, he's not sleeping, he's dead. And I, uh, for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. So Jesus uses that, that sleep-death uh, analogy. So Paul is using it too in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, he writes this, verses 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. In other words, this is not something that was clear in the Old Testament. It was hidden in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7. The rapture was laid out. But it was a mystery because nobody really understood it. Because it wasn't plainly laid out until Jesus plainly laid it out in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, which we just looked at. So Paul's saying, I'm going to explain this mystery from the Old Testament that Isaiah alluded to in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it says, excuse me, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised and corruptible, and we shall all be changed. And then he goes on to add, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. What is he talking about? He's talking about trading our physical bodies that we're living in right now for permanent immortal bodies that don't grow old, don't get fat, don't become bald, and don't die. We're going to trade these temporary bodies for new, indestructible, resurrection, immortal bodies that can never die. That's what Paul means when he says, this corrupt wire, dying bodies, even born-again believers are trapped in dying bodies. We're going to trade these bodies at the rapture for immortal bodies that can't die. And then the most clear-cut, laid-out, irrefutable rapture verse in the Bible, um, in addition to John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, is Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the first of the two that he wrote to the Thessalonians, um, for, uh, chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. I'll just read that for you real quick. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep means what again? Death. Yes. Concerning those that have died, uh, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. In other words, he's saying, you can be sad for your lost loved one, but if they're saved, don't sorrow in the same way as the world does, because you're going to see your loved ones again, because they died in Christ. The world that lost their loved ones, they're never going to see their loved ones again. So they mourn in a different way because it's real sad for them. But if you're born again and they were born again, don't worry about it. You're going to see each other as just a short uh, repast until we get together again. So then he says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. In other words, if you died in Christ, being a born again Christian, God's going to bring them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, this isn't just my opinion. This is the word of God, which was originally laid out for us in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 7, and then clarified by Jesus in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. He says the rapture concept is irrefutable because it's in the word of God. And he says, For this I say you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord at the rapture shall not precede them which are asleep. And the King James says, shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, that means, shall not precede them which have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, not to sleep, but the dead in Christ shall rise first, rise from the grave. Where are they rising to? Not to the surface of the earth, we find out, because it says in the next verse, then we which are alive, that are already born again at the rapture, shall that are alive and remain on the surface of the earth shall be caught up into, together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The word caught up in the Greek is harpazo, which means to be snatched. In Latin, it's pronounced rapturo. So the word rapture is in the Bible, but because it's a Latin word, it's in the Latin Bible. 
in the Greek Bible, it's harpato, which is a Greek word. In the English Bible, they use an English phrase, caught up, but they all mean the same. Caught up, harpato, and rapture all means to be snatched from the face of the earth into heaven by Jesus when he comes for us at the church, and the dead in Christ will be with us, going up into the clouds. Where? To meet the Lord in the air. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's not comforting to tell people you've got to go through the tribulation period and meet the Antichrist at the guillotine. Then you can be with Jesus. That's not comforting. You can't comfort somebody with the words. If you and your little girl and your wife and your four-year-old son, you guys have to all meet the Antichrist, and after being tortured at the FEMA camp, have to meet him one last time at the guillotine and have your head chopped off. And then you can be with the Lord. That's not encouragement. You know? So it, if it was a harsh truth, it's a harsh truth. But it's not words of, hey, comfort one another. Those, Guess what? Your little girl's going to get her head cut off. But after that, she'll be okay. You know, it's going to hurt for a little while, you know, and you're going to have to watch it. So that's going to suck. But, you know, isn't that comforting? That just doesn't make me feel any better about the situation, right? Mm -hmm. So what Jesus is saying, no, the church isn't going through all that guillotine, facing the Antichrist, tortured, and having your head cut off stuff. No, the church that's alive at the time at, of the rapture, at the time when the church era comes to an end, they're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord, not on the earth, but in the air, and the dead in Christ are going to be caught up with us. And we're going to be caught up to meet Jesus, not in the rally, not at the Benny Hinn rally, not at some amphitheater uh, with, with, with some church uh, Christian rock musicians on, 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 the, on the stage. No, we're going to meet Jesus in the clouds in the air. If you meet a Jesus anywhere other than that, he's a fake Jesus. If only people knew that when David Crest claimed to be Christ. If only people knew that when Jim Jones took a bunch of people from the inner cities of Chicago to the jungles of Guyana, South, South America, and killed them all. If they had known what their Bible said, that you can't meet Jesus in Chicago and then go to Guyana with him. You can't meet Jesus in a warehouse church in Doral. You can't meet Jesus in Waco, Texas, in a warehouse filled with uh, munitions and rifles and guns and bombs. That's not Jesus. Because if you met that guy, it can't be the Lord because the next place where the church meets Jesus is in the clouds in the air to take us back to the Father's house. So it says that right there. So, Saturday, September 23rd, 2017, 3 p.m. is not going to be the rapture. It might be the Friday preceding it, and it very well may be the Sunday afterwards. But, Jesus says, since no man knows the day or the hour, all those rapture, fake Christian prophecy buffs that have predicted these things on YouTube, I think they've done it because they're satanic counterfeits, and what their goal is, is to do what? Their goal is to trick people into believing uh, that the rapture is a bunch of nonsense and it's mythological and and that you know you know they can make fun of us on Sunday. We're not saying the rapture is going to happen at three o'clock on Saturday, uh, September twenty uh, third, twenty seventeen, because no man knows the day of that. But it's going to happen sometime around our current time. Why? Because of Hurricane Irma, because of Hurricane Maria. Because of Hurricane Harvey, because of the earthquake in, in Mexico two weeks ago, because of the earthquake in Mexico two days ago, because Kim Jong Un has detonated a hydrogen bomb, because there's ethnic unrest in the United States of America, there's ethnic unrest in Africa, there's ethnic unrest in Europe, there's ethnic unrest between Russia and um, Ukraine. Even though you know, to the average Western observer, like you guys are all Russians anyway, aren't you? Like, no, oh, we're Ukrainian. How dare you say that we're Russian? You know. But you speak a similar language, you look kind of the same. No, 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 it's a huge difference between Russians and Ukrainians. We hate each other. We're going to war. You know, so you have these ethnic tribes of people going to war with one another, just like Jesus said will be happening before the second coming. And he also said, what? That the Nephilim, oh, posse in the church. And so, Steve, you mentioned that. So why don't you, you, you can end this, Steve, by flipping over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <laughs> 1 through, verses 1 through 12. But, but clearly what Jesus is saying is that the Nephilim will have returned to the earth, just like in the days of Noah. They're going to be intermarrying with the human race, and I think that we have that already happened with these transgenic, 
superhuman super soldier types that we keep hearing stories about. We keep seeing superhero movies and television shows and all this stuff promoting the concept because it's externalization of the hierarchy. It's the preparation of us psychologically to accept the inevitable. They may call them, oh, we're the, your, your, your alien space brothers that have come down and interbred with the human race. No, it is the return of the Nephilim predicted by Jesus in Matthew 24. But, to close out, let's take a look and see what Paul had to say in 2 Thessalonians, the second letter he wrote to the church about the rapture and about the Antichrist, and he ties in a whole new concept that's also one of the super signs of the approaching rapture and the rise of the Antichrist. Hit us, Steve, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 through 12. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. See, there's, there's two things right there. It says, by the by what, Steve? That's it. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Okay, so what he's talking about is what? The uh, coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at Armageddon, mm -hmm. which is at the end of the tribulation period. But then he's talking about a second uh, you know, event. Our gathering together to him. That's the rapture. So Paul was talking about the second coming of Jesus, but it's preceded by 70 years by the rapture of the church before the second coming to the earth. Go ahead, Steve. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Stop Some right there. The the falling away. The term falling away in the... Um, Original Greek is the word apostasia, and that's where we get the word apostasy, like, oh man, he's an apostate. It means to depart. It can mean a literal departure. Her tried to depart Miami to escape the hurricane to go to Michigan or to New York, but because the tickets were $5,000 and none of them were available and he didn't have enough gas to drive to Georgia, he had to stay in Miami for the hurricane. Steve, on the other hand, got smart, got a head start, and was able to drive to Alabama. So Steve departed South Beach and drove to Alabama. So he departed Miami Beach, South Beach, to Alabama for the hurricane. Now, there's also a departure that's sort of figurative. Uh, departing from a belief in Jesus as the Messiah, born of a virgin, to believing that Jesus was not born of a virgin and wasn't God in human flesh, which is what some people who call themselves Christian, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus is God in human flesh, but they call themselves Christian. They've departed from the original doctrine that says Jesus was born of a virgin, he was God in human flesh. There are people that call themselves Christians that no longer believe that because they've departed from the doctrine once delivered to the saints in the word of God. They are therefore what? Apostates, Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholics, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, apostates, because they've departed to a type of Christianity that's different than the original doctrine given for Christianity in the Bible. So, I, I, I've been drunk, I digress. Go ahead, Steve. That the man of sin, see, uh, except they're called the fallen away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what was holdeth, that he might be revealed at his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. Now what does that mean? In, in the uh, New King James says, he who restrains will do so until he be taken out of the way. The he that's doing the restraining is the Holy Spirit. And he's restraining the the what? The revealing of the man of sin, which is the Antichrist. Antichrist can't be revealed until after two things. Apostasy comes into the church, and then the real church goes out of the world. Once that happens, the double apostasia, then the Antichrist can be revealed. And once the Antichrist is revealed, then the mystery of God, the godliness can, you know, lawlessness can be revealed upon the earth, and then a bunch of bad things are going to happen. So, Steve, pick it up from there. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, 
with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So it says, yeah, you know, in the King James it says, believe the lie. So clearly, the Antichrist will come after the church is raptured, but before the church is raptured, what happens? False doctrine comes into the church, a portion of people calling themselves Christians believe it. The real church that believes the biblical doctrine, Jesus, God, and human flesh, the rapture is real, all these things, hell is a real place, they get raptured out of the world. The left behind fake Christians will now be ruled over by that wicked one, who through signs and wonders and lying wonders will deceive the left behind false apostate church into believing he's the Messiah. They will follow after this individual and then God will send strong delusion to them to believe the lie. What, what lie is that? That uh, the Antichrist is the real Messiah? Or that UFOs came and took all those two or three hundred million people that disappeared overnight that one time? That was the space brethren taking the bad people out of the earth and everybody left behind the good people as long as they take the mark of the beast and bow down and worship the real Messiah who is now the wicked one, the Antichrist. That is what Paul writes down God's going to send those people left behind a strong delusion that they might be damned. Um, why? Because they did not believe the love of the truth. They can be condemned because they did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God himself will send the false church, those left behind after the rapture, a strong delusion so that they can be damned. As Dave Hunt puts it, God's going to give them the power to believe the lie that they've always wanted to believe anyway. He's just making it easier for him to do it. So, with that, that's what's coming, folks. And we know that because we've seen all these hurricanes, all these earthquakes, all these threats of war, all at the same time. We now know that the very next huge stop uh, on the biblical timeline will be the rapture of the church. And after that, the false church will continue on into the tribulation period and be ruled over by the Antichrist who will now be able to be revealed. And at the end of that seven years, the church that has been raptured will have been married to Jesus, become the bride of Christ, and will come back to the earth to end the reign of the Antichrist. And we will begin a thousand year reign with Jesus on the earth, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So those of us that are tired, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. <laughs> He's tired, we're all tired. But we're going to get seven years, days of rest. We're going to have a honeymoon phase for seven years. And when we come back after that, we're going to be real refreshed because we're going to be living in new, indestructible, immortal bodies that can't ever get tired again. So, encouraging words. When you look at the hurricanes, when you look at the earthquakes, when you look at the threat of war, when you look at all these disasters coming one right after another, after another, after another, the response of the morning of Christian isn't to become discouraged. It is terrible. No, the response of us is to get excited because it means quitting time is almost here. Our shift is almost over. Our time on the wall as watchmen has almost drawn to a, a conclusion. And for those of us that have been steadily at work for the Lord over the course of our lifetimes over the last few years or however long it's been since you've been saved, you know, at, when you've been working, you get tired. And you're like, man, I can't wait till it's over. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day of rest. The Bible says there remains, therefore, a day of rest for the people of the Lord. And everybody that's truly born again has already been tested by Satan, has already put work in for Jesus. And like any other real human, atomic human being in a physical body that's dying, you should be tired. You should be putting forth effort. Just like when you go to the gym, you come back to the gym, like, man, I'm sore, I'm tired, man, I, but I got a good workout in. And you should be looking forward to your, your, your season of rest. If you're not, you're looking forward to the next Super Bowl, or looking forward to the Academy Awards, looking forward to your next boyfriend, or looking forward to your next affair, that might mean that you're not actually born again. The Bible says, examine yourself, whether you really be in the faith. Going to church doesn't make you part of the faith. Going to church or singing in the choir doesn't mean that you're born again. It doesn't mean you're going home in the rapture. Being born again means that you're part of the church, that you're going home in the rapture. If you're not born again, then you can't be saved. Uh, but you can be saved by becoming born again. So take a look at John chapter 3, see what it says, and do that. And then once you do that, accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're part of the church, you put in your work, working day is almost over, folks. Our time, our sojourn here on the earth, Paul and 
I think it's Paul, uh, that wrote the book of Hebrews. Some people, you know, question. But Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about, you know, we are strangers and pilgrims in the earth. We're just sort of passing through. We are supposed to be, once we're born, we should be considered by the world strangers. Like, oh, those born again, some odd folks. They don't do the same things. They don't think the same way. They don't even like it here, you know. He doesn't even consider Ann Arbor, Michigan his home. He considers, what, the New Jerusalem and heaven, the Father's house? What's that? Oh, you know, what a killjoy that is. So we are, according to the Bible, strangers and pilgrims in the earth. We're just here for a season of time to give salt and light to the rest of the world and help the rest of the world that's not saved understand how they can be saved and go home with us in the rapture. That's our job. Whether or not you're, you're, you're a pastor or you're a male human, everybody can share the gospel of Jesus with somebody that they know. I don't know the people you know, but you know the people you know, and you know that they need to hear about Jesus. So you do your job and share with, with Jesus you know with the people to like Ben went down in Brazil and is going back to Brazil if the rapture doesn't come first. You may never make it back to Brazil because the rapture is probably going to occur before that. But if it doesn't, you're going to go back and give the information that you know about how to come to Jesus to the people that God puts in your path. And I'm doing it to the people that God puts in my path and who tunes in here to the you know, South Beach Gospel Ministries where people are running to when I'm doing street evangelism Saturday morning, which, thank goodness, we'll be able to get back to doing now that the, the hurricanes for now, gone, but I'm, I'm hearing the meteorologist saying Maria can take a turn and it can oh, be in no. South Beach in another few days, but I don't think it'll be here before Saturday, right? So we got one more day. Within the next 48 hours, we'll, we'll get that last, you know, street evangelism push in and then the raffle for Sunday just to <laughs> confound all the Bible prophecy uh, fakers on YouTube that say it's going to happen Saturday. So with that, Ben closes up, and if the Lord doesn't come back in the rapture Friday or Sunday, We'll see you guys next week when we will pick up and conclude Revelation chapter 13. It's past, goodness, where did the time go? It's past 9 o'clock already, and we haven't even started Revelation chapter 13's conclusion, which we were supposed to do. But we got preempted by a special message from the Lord for you about the second coming and the rapture and the signs of the season. So, Ben, close us out there, my brother. Lord, we are so grateful to be able to bathe in your word and not to be bathing in the Bay of Biscayne. Mm. Um, we are so grateful for your most amazing prophecy, uh, that your word is filled with prophecy. And among the most important of those is about your return. We are so grateful to be given the signs of the season that we are in. And for us born again Christians, this is the most glorious and wonderful season to be alive. So Lord, please use these, these hurricanes, these disasters to your will. May Harvey, Irma, Jose, Maria be used such that you can bring more people to you and put us, your servants, Lord, in the right place at the right time so that we may do that work for you, act as your instruments. We're so grateful to be here, Lord. We're ready to go when you want us to. But please allow us to do your work while we're still here on this earth. Thank you very much for this, this uh, wonderful Bible study group, this small home church, that all of us are well here and on internet land. And we pray that you guide us forever. Amen. All right, let's be close. All right, so there we have it.